This is the 13th video in the scripting series, and today we're gonna to be covering services. I'm gonna cover 10 different services. I'm going to quickly give you a brief overview of what each of these services does, and then I'll cover each in more detail in future videos. A service is a singleton, which is a class with only one instance. So unlike parts, which there can be many of, there's only one of each of these services, and services are designed with a specific purpose. You can access the services with this get service function. We do game, colon, get service, and then in quotations, the name of the service. So to get the player service, you do game, colon, get service, players. That's not the only way to access all of the services. For example, Workspace has this global variable, but you can access all of them with this get service function. So that's what I recommend you do. Most likely you're familiar with the Workspace. The Workspace just holds any objects that exist in the 3D world. The player service contains any player objects for players currently connected to a Roblox game. A useful property of the player service is the local player, which gives you the player whose client is currently running a game. Another useful function is the get players function, which gives you a table of all the player objects that are currently in a game. So this will give you any player that's currently playing a game. One useful event of the player service is the player added event, which fires when a player enters the game. So this is useful if you want to do something for every player that is added or joins a game. The user input service is used to detect different user inputs from different devices. So that could be left clicks, right clicks, mouse scrolls, key input. It could be from an iPad. It could be the accelerometer to detect the iPad movement or tablet movement. It can also be used to detect Xbox controller input. One thing to note about this service is that it is client side only. So you have to use it in a local script or a module script that is required by a local script. The reason for that is that you're detecting user input. So obviously that's gonna be on the client side only. The main way you'll see this used is with the input began function, input changed function, and input ended function. These detect when input begins, changes, or ends. This is how you might use the input began event. So as you can see here, we're getting the user input service, and then we're connecting the input began event to the input began function right here. So every time we detect a input, which is a mouse button one input, then this function prints the left mouse button has been pressed. Again, this is just a quick overview. I'll explain this in more depth in the future, but I'm just showing you what each does so you can understand what you need to learn to accomplish certain tasks. So now you know that you can use the user input service to detect user input. You may have heard of the mouse service before. It's actually been superseded by the user input service and context action service. So don't use mouse. Anything that mouse can do can be done by one of these two services. Speaking of context action service, context action service is a service that allows you to bind user input to contextual actions. This is better than just using user input in general. By binding it to an action and then unbinding it, you can be a lot more specific for when you might want the input to actually do something. Here we have a reload action. We're binding it when we equip the tool. So here we have the equipped event, and then we're using the bind action function right here and binding the action to the key code R. That way, when we press this key code R, the handle action function right here is executed, and then we will print reloading. And this is only done when the tool is equipped. As soon as the tool is unequipped, we then unbind that action so that it is no longer effective. Replicated storage is a container whose contents are replicated to all connected clients, allowing both the client and the server to access the objects in replicated storage. So that's why it's an ideal location for remote functions and events because both the client and the server can access them. Another thing to note is that scripts and local scripts will not run when they're in replicated storage. Module scripts will run as long as they're required by a script or local script that is in some location where they will run. And one use for replicated storage would be to just store things that you don't have a use for yet, but you will later. For example, maybe your game has multiple maps and you need to switch between them quickly. And you can just do that by switching the parent from replicated storage to workspace and back. And that way, um, when you have it in workspace, you can see it. When it's in replicated storage, you cannot see it. Server storage is similar to the replicated storage, but it's only on the server. It's not replicated to the client side. That means that anything in server storage can only be accessed by the server. And because it's not replicated, you probably shouldn't be putting any local scripts in there because they're going to be on the server and not the client. One useful function of server storage is stated right here. You can actually improve the loading time of your game if you have large objects such as maps in server storage and then move them from server storage to the workspace to load them in. I know I just stated before that you could use the replicated storage for maps. You could use either. It just depends on your game, how large the maps are. 
So if you're having some troubles with loading times, maybe check out server storage, throw your large maps in here, or just assets that you don't need to use immediately. And then later on, you could write some code that imports them or moves them from server storage to maybe replicated storage or to the workspace, wherever you need them, only when it's necessary. Replicated first is similar to the ones before, but it's actually the first thing that's loaded and it's only loaded on the client side. Replicated first is great for things such as loading screens or things that are time critical and need to be executed as soon as the player is joining a game. Because local scripts in replicated first are the first things to run, that's why it's great for custom loading screens that you can throw up just so a player has instant feedback that the game's loading and you can add a touch of character for your game by having that custom loading screen. There's an example at the bottom for a custom loading screen and then there's actually a full article right here if you want to see how to make a custom loading screen. I might do a tutorial on that in the future. Comment down below if you'd be interested in that. Data store service is used to save information during your game. So if you want to save a player's progress, you'll need to use this service. Marketplace service is used for in-game transactions. So if you've ever seen a pop-up like this in a game that was using marketplace service, this is great if you have an in-game currency you want players to be able to purchase or also just special items or game passes. The last service that I'm going to cover in this video is run service and this has methods and events used for time management as well as context. So you have functions such as is client, is server, and is studio, which can determine the context the code is running. So that's useful for module scripts because module scripts could run in both the client and the server. So being able to check that is useful as well as is studio could be used for additional debugging behaviors. You also see people using the step, heartbeat, and render stepped events. The heartbeat event fires every frame after the physics have been simulated. Render stepped fires every frame prior to the frame being rendered and then stepped fires every frame prior to the physics simulation. I'm not gonna get into the details of these events just yet. There's some example code at the bottom that you can see that uses the stepped event, and this is just creating a part that flies in a certain direction at a certain speed. Down here, they're connecting a function to the stepped event, and then that means that this function right here is going to be called every frame prior to the physics simulation. I said 10, I'm actually going to talk about an 11th one right here, or 12th if you include mouse. So the debris service allows you to schedule the removal of an object without yielding any code. And you can do that with the debris add item method. So that's really useful for things like projectiles because one method to do this without the debris service would be to wait three and then destroy it, or wait some time and then destroy it. But that has a yield, this wait would yield the code. And it's a little bit more complicated to explain what a yield is um, because you have to know about threads. But basically, this is a great service to use for things that you know the lifetime of. So down here, this is an example of how you might do it. The projectile will be removed after three seconds. So we have the service, colon, add item. We add the projectile to the debris, and then we give it a lifetime of three seconds. After three seconds, the projectile is removed. As always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to leave any comments below or join the Discord to ask your questions. Like the video if it helped you out and subscribe for more in the future.